the theme for the afternoon talk is the stopping and starting of the heart. And I'm not talking about this one, of course. It uh, isn't unusual for us in uh, day-to-day life to be rather concerned about various issues which come to our life and one that's immediately coming to mind for a lot of people in a variety of ways is the whole issue of money and debt and having and not having. But I think sometimes as well we can rather see that as a certain kind of parallel which in fact goes on in the heart too. And what I've got in mind here is in our communication, in our relationships with people that matter uh, to us, there has to be, of course, a certain amount of giving and receiving uh, that takes place. And for the heart to flow easily and freely in life, it requires of us a lot of understanding of our capacity and to develop the capacity to be able to give and to receive and to let that flow happen. But how easily the interruptions of that take place and the kind of blocking uh, that goes on and the way that affects not only our inner life and happiness and joy and love and contentment inwardly but also and significantly affects the lives of others as well. So the entering into the heart and to bring love and concern uh, into the heart does require from us a looking and noticing what actually blocks that flow. What kind of situations arise and occur which inhibit uh, that. And I think sometimes in the dynamic that goes on and perhaps some of the most difficult and stressful situations in life are those situations which do concern others that others are involved in our personal storyline and all the tension and conflict that goes with it. And in the communication that takes place, one of the factors that make for a problem in life, in the heart flow, is giving with strings attached. That's a recipe for a nightmare. Giving with strings attached. And sometimes, <coughs> we, whoever we are, profess that we're giving. And the ways and the forms of giving, of course, can be very varied. They can be in the material forms of uh, gifts and um, money. It can be in the form of uh, giving a person time. It can be in the form of giving uh, another person uh, energy. Um, Doing things on behalf of that uh, person. It can be giving in the forms of um, um, commitment and uh, availability. And sometimes when we look at our our life and our communications uh, with with each other, we see, or we think we see, that there is some gestures and statements of giving which is taking place. But the self, the I, the me and the my, rather quickly and sometimes unbelievably quickly, isn't actually in the art of heartful giving it's actually looking for an exchange 
and therefore the underlying message at times can be with us. We say or we proclaim, I've done so much for you, is the favourite mantra. And in doing so much for you, there's an underlying tone that goes along with it of getting something back in return. And this in turn, of course, does generate so much pressure upon the other. Sometimes, of course, it comes rather uh, uh, sadly from parent to children. And the children are expected uh, to do uh, prostrations in front of the parents for all that they have done for us. It can come in relationships, uh, employer, employee, in personal relationships, in friendship. And so sometimes this, the heart, can't expand. Warm, loving feelings in life can't flow because they're being measured all the time. The self is measuring. And that's all the poor, pathetic little self knows. It measures. And so we'll say to another, I have done this for you. And then out comes the boring list from the past. And this puts a kind of undue and unnecessary pressure upon the other person. And some are willing to support this market mentality of the heart, well, I'm giving you this, therefore I want something back, are often quite willing to go back in time for years. Years. They'll get out their diaries from the past and, and, and draw up a list to prove how much I have given you. And one wonders, one ends up in a doubt, was this actually giving? There's a Buddhist word for this, most of you know, dana, D-A-N-A, usually thought of the, as donations these, these days. It doesn't capture it at all. It's all about that generosity of the heart, that generosity of, of spirit. And in that, if giving is to come very cleanly from us, and it isn't easy, we can't have reference to the past. Because if we do, sooner or later, we'll be dragging up the past. And we'll be saying, not, I am giving to you. But what we really will be saying is, um, I'm in the marketplace of the emotion. This is for you, I want this back from you. And it's market mind. And it's an enormous challenge for all of us in the practice of letting go, in the practice of forgetting the past, to actually allow heart to flow freely, generously, and to trust in that expression. Because I think we all know those times and those experiences when that isn't happening, and thus it corrupts the love. It corrupts the respect, it corrupts the sensitivity, it corrupts the openness, because the soul has grabbed onto an idea in the language of giving, and it's forgotten it's not giving, it's wanting in exchange. Spiritual life is about that kind of depth of exploring what giving is and all the risks that go with it. What about the poor plight of the receiver? Someone has been giving to us. Giving in slight, in quotation marks, of course, yes. And that person feels that perhaps from us she or he hasn't received enough. They haven't got enough back. They feel they have given more. And, and so there is some pressure. The strings attach, 
strings, not strings, handcuffs, chains, they are. And so the person says to us, I've given you so much and you haven't given me enough. And uh, I've spent so much time for you, but what have you done for me? All oh, 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 this boy, melodrama. EastEnders recycled. <laughs> Not that I've ever watched it, but I hear from my daughter. And, but what's the impact on the person who says they're giving, but there are strings attached? And one of the often effects of that kind of impact on our own heart is we feel some kind of debt. We feel Maybe they're right. We feel maybe he or she or, or, or they has, has really pinned us down. And therefore we end up emotionally in our heart, in our, fee- in our feeling of being in debt to this person. Because they've done more than what we've done. And how easily, if we had some... Um, uh, low sense of self-worth, if we just have a little low sense of self-esteem, if we have a vulnerability to being negative about, our, about ourselves, and then someone that we know, who knows us very well, comes along and lays a number on us because we're not giving. It easily impacts inside of us, and then we end up feeling difficult, pained, distress, and we feel that somehow we've got to make up. We're in debt. We're in emotional debt to this person. One's got strings attached. The other feels very unhappy with the pressure. And what would happen out of that? What's going to happen? And the outcome of this, of course, inwardly, in our heart, the heart begins to block off. It can start to withdraw. It can feel terrible pressure. We can begin to feel despair. We can begin to feel worthless and, and uh, useless and, and uh, aberration of existence. And shouldn't have been born and all, all sorts of views despairing views can arise uh, within us because we buy the pressure (coughs) we buy the pressure on us and we begin to believe what we're told about us how unkind, insensitive, unaware selfish, withdrawn all these one-liners that poor human species get thrown which we throw at each other again and again So one has a sense of debt, the other has the strings attached, and this dynamic causes enormous tension in people's lives. And you know, on the streets and other situations, poor old Dharma teachers and poor old therapists and others all hearing this all the time. So something has to change inside of us, some other way of looking. So if we're that first kind of person, and we're committed and we want our heart to flow freely and happily and we don't want to be constantly exerting pressure on others and sometimes we'll put more pressure on those who are close to us than anybody else more pressure on those who are close to us than anybody else it's a rather odd form of love So, having access to love and to kindness and uh, to warmth also means what does it mean to be in communication (laughs) without strings attached? What would be the quality of the heart? What would it be to abide in the heart without that kind of demand? What would the 
tone be? What would the attitude be? What would we say? How would we listen? We'd certainly need to listen to a softer and more kindly voice within. We'd certainly have to be in our heart rather clear between the difference between giving and exchanging. We'd certainly need to trust in generosity of spirit, in sana generosity of spirit. Rather than imagining and hoping rather naively that others only exist to fulfil our needs. This is idealism gone berserk. To think that others exist to fulfil our needs. Oh, this expressing it. Oh, they don't. We don't. So, it's not easy. In the moment that we feel some kind of break going on inside, some kind of block, what the Buddhists call hindrance, hindrance to the free flow of the heart, do we have the capacity to genuinely acknowledge this? To be completely clear about it? But also in our being clear about it, to actually see within ourselves, we can let the heart flow more easily. We can practice it. And if for every, whatever, five or ten times you and I find the resistance coming up, the block coming up, the strings attached coming up, in whatever way that may be, and we just catch it once and dissolve it, that we don't give it authority in speech, we don't give it authority in letter writing, and we don't give it authority in that contemporary curse called email. We don't fire them off. Because we're learning to listen to a deeper, softer, more kindly place in the heart, which not only allows us to be, but also allows others to be who they are. Allows others to be who they are. Sometimes when it's from the standpoint of death, sometimes the death, I mentioned parents and uh, 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 children, (coughs) as one example. Sometimes um, children, and they can be of any, any, uh, uh, any age, that we can spend rather a lot of our, our life if we haven't come into adulthood properly rather in the shadow of parents. And sometimes our best parents and their best intentions with us naturally might want the best from us. And most parents, I can speak as a parent here, um, want the best for the children. But the idea of what is best in terms of child and parent, may have a huge gap in it. And so sometimes parents, no matter what the age of their children are, children can be 50, 60, 70 at the very old parents, and still it's the same relationship. And so the son or the daughter can spend a lot of time feeling or making the effort to please parents. There's no pleasing of parents who have strings attached. It is hopeless. I can say as a parent here, 
as, as well as the sun. I was just in Australia in December. My mother, God bless her, at the age of 78, I like her spirit, oh, you know, it's quite inspiring, at the age of 78, emigrated to Australia. <laughs> now I remember when I was in my early 20s hitchhiking to India, and she said, you're in your early 20s, you're too old to be doing that. <laughs> so I had the same thought. So in December, my daughter, Nishona, who was 20, and, and her uh, son, who was 11 months uh, old at that time, my daughter went off to uh, university to London to study, to get a degree in midwifery. And six months into the midwifery course, got pregnant. <laughs> And they always said experience came first, but I didn't quite mean it like that. <laughs> and so, the three of us, that is, daughter, her son, and my poor self, went off to Brisbane to see my mother, this was in December. So we were in a tiny little flat. I mean, you know, the front room was about as big as that floor space behind me. Four generations. I mean, talk about test of equanimity. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it went rather well. All in all, I think it went rather well. Uh, and sometimes in the generations, all things past and present, and etc., etc., uh, do arise. If within I don't think, hopefully, I don't think there's too much in uh, our, uh, our, our family, but there is um, the feeling of death. It's a constant pressure on the mind. And thoughts are constantly arising of what I need to do for this person, or what I should do, or what I have failed to do, or what I really must do in the future. And that kind of pressure is some kind of emotional debt in which it's going on inside of us hoping that in some way or other we're going to cancel the debt and that this person will accept us and this person will be pleased with us and this person will be satisfied with us and therefore all will be peace and harmony because we've cancelled the debt. How can the person, how can that happen if there are strings attached? Old ones are complete and new ones begin and this goes on and on and on. So if we think that somehow or other, if we feel some inner debt towards other or others, that if there is any trace inside of us that the other person is going to be overwhelmed with gratitude that we've completed, I think we'll be very lucky. Lucky bordering on the miraculous. <laughs> lucky as miraculous as Jesus resurrecting into heaven today. So something within has to change. Otherwise we keep looking externally for some kind of measurement from somebody else to tell us you're okay. I'm okay. And we can spend. Oh my God, we can spend. So much of our poor old existence. Looking around for others. To keep telling us we're okay. And we can hear it a thousand times. And we never believe them. It's a little temporary Really tragic, tragic. So the heart to flow to discover and to um, recover its kind of natural uh, um, emotional strength and to feel 
a sense of joy. This looking, as I mentioned earlier, of are we living in our existence or coexistence with strings attached? One. Secondly, are we living our life constantly feeling in debt to others and trying and again and again to cancel out the debt? And therefore, perhaps, in either case, we'll need to be, if the heart is to be strong and steady, much more here and now than we've ever been before. Because in either case, the feeling of debt and all the the guilt and the discomfort and the self-blame is all tied up with holding to the past. And the strings attached and those wretched lists of things that when there are strings attached that get directed towards us. All of that is attached to the past as well. And we've got to feel in ourselves for the heart to flow more easily and freely and generously. That we genuinely are moving on from the past no matter what it is. We genuinely are committed. And that's where the, the Dharma teachings and the practices and the heart practices that you and I are engaged in uh, here matter to the heart because they can give us a sense of, uh, of uh, a fresh beginning, of beginner's mind, of a new birth, of a new beginning. And to really make that sense of a new beginning, no matter what it is, and no matter who it is, and no matter what the baggage we have with the past, to actually make the new beginning a real, fresh focus for us, with whoever it is. Then there won't be the strings attached, and then there won't, won't be this constant feeling of being in debt, because it's inexhaustible, that feeling. The other, which goes with this, in the uh, teachings of um, uh, liberation, sometimes it's forgotten that in a free and liberated awareness, heartfelt awareness of life, it's not only the immense value and, and beautiful significance for our inner life that feel that uh, inner spaciousness which has no boundaries and no limits to it. But also, one of the natural outcomes of that is that it also places much less pressure on others. We're not living beholding to. We're not living making demands upon We've seen the futility of it. The heart has freed itself up. And in the freeing of it, itself up, it's not only wise and healthy for us, but for others. And so sometimes it needs from us for the heart to flow clearly, to really take a real clear look and say, where is the holding going on? What would change the holding? let heart breathe more freely. The other, and I think this is is extraordinarily important, and it kind of gets, um, what do we call it, uh, mentioned all too glibly, and uh, rather uh, superficially. So what, I, what I'm talking about here is the nature. And there's a lot of, not only from the, um, my good environmentalist friends, but um, in general uh, talk, etc., uh, etc., etc. 
various programs that go out, the, the, the books that go out, the encouragement to be in the nature, the protection of the nature, the people looking after their gardens, and all the things that go on. But one of the more significant aspects of all of this is that areas of communication and all the variety of roles <coughs> in life that you and I uh, refer to have accelerated in their significance to such a degree, way, way above their importance, partly because we have neglected the non-human world. We've neglected it. And so the day and the days of our life can be so consumed in human activity, all the ways socially and leisurely and working and communicating and telephoning and all the meetings and all the things that go on, that the, the life, the human life, becomes so paramount what's going on in our life with other people and with ourselves that correspondingly everything else recedes. So the only issues of life that matter, the only thing that matters is one's relationship with oneself, one's relationship with other people, past or present. And the whole inner life is consumed with this involvement. It's completely out of perspective. If something has to allow that to that elevated world, the ongoing soap operas of existence, something has to allow that which has been elevated to be so important to lower itself, to fit in with everything else. And one of the key factors for that is the nature. Is the nature. And most people will say, they don't mean it, but they'll probably say, oh, I love being in the nature. At any excuse, people will opt out of being in the nature. Why? Because they miss the intensity of, of human interaction. They miss the soap operas, they miss the dramas, and they miss all that goes on uh, with that. So if we're going to get our interhuman life in some kind of balance. It really is going to need some kind of awareness and shift in other areas of our, of our life and to really explore and feel and find out what that means. And sometimes that will mean as well going through, for some, one of the more difficult experiences of life, which, the, which is the feeling of loneliness. And if one lowers the temperature of all the human interaction and wants the heart to flow more easily and uh, freely, not only is it going to need from us really much more in touch with the nature, but also it's going to need a shift inside of us from loneliness to a love of aloneness. And that's a very beautiful shift to make. From loneliness, feeling lonely, to the love of aloneness. And if that begins to happen inside of us, to really enjoy that and to find and explore the way of doing that to extend ourselves alone into the nature it itself will give the heart greater inner strength and in itself we can live with others as they are not as we think they should be
we can live with others as they are, not as we think they should be. Soon the time again here, the usual reminders. Please, please make maximum use of the nature. You might wake up in the middle of the night and it's whatever it is, two or three in the morning. And you've got loads of energy. Got more energy at three in the morning than three in the afternoon. And then the first thought arises, oh, I want to get back to sleep. No, don't bother going back to sleep. You're going to have enough sleep when you're dead. <laughs> get up. <laughs> Do something. Go out into the nature. Sit with the nuns in the cemetery behind the company. Feel the night hours. Feel the day. Feel the experience of just being alone and knowing in the middle of the night that the vast, vast majority of people in the same hemisphere, the rule is out. That kind of out. And one's alive and conscious and, and awake. And just appreciate the night hour. Appreciate the stillness. Appreciate the empty hall. Appreciate the quietitude that's... Uh, going on uh, around you. Pre- appreciate the silence and the, st- the stillnesses and the softness in the hours of the night. So much which is beautiful in life we just neglect because the poor wretched little self all it wants is more sleep. It's not a teaching of sleeping, it's a teaching of awakening. <laughs> People forget this. So those times when the energy is flowing, and that could be at any, any time, that's a reminder to us to use the time. And if we attend and take an interest, then out of, out of all of this, that commitment, as I said earlier, learning to let the generosity of heart flow more free and one important expression of that is living and giving without strings attached. So in our freedom, we genuinely are giving others the freedom to be (coughs) who they are, whether we like it or not. May all be live for the way. May all beings abide with a generous flow of love. May all beings live a truly expansive life. Let's have a couple of quiet minutes together. (coughs) Thank you for listening. To learn how you can support the teachers and Dharma Seed, please visit dharmaseed.org slash donate.